hello and welcome back. So now that we have finally sorted out the prior and posterior distributions in the previous parts of the series, we can now start to implement the random walk metropolis algorithm itself. So let's see what we need to do for that. So what do we need? We first need an initial state and we need to be a bit careful. Our random quantity is called theta, not x, because we are trying to make inference about the parameter theta. So let's call that theta j. And we need to start with the value which is possible to happen, so which has pi of theta greater than zero. And what I want to do here is I want to just start with a random value. That is clearly possible under the prior because that's how we generated it. And the likelihood, which we still see here, does not exclude it either because all data is always possible under any parameter theta, so that can never be zero here. Then we need to run our loop. So for j in one to n, say, let's do 10 steps for now. And what we need to do, we need to first create a proposal. I'm not quite sure how to call that now when the state is theta, I think I call it y anyway. So yj is theta j. And for random walk metropolis, the most normal thing to do would be to at a normal distribution which has the same variance for all components, we may need to look into using different variances for different components. But for now, let's just try that. Theta has length two times k we established earlier. It must have mean zero, there is no choice. And the standard deviation, I just choose the number here, sigma, that would make it the same for all, or we could plug in a vector if we want different variances for different components. So. Sigma, let's just take a number and I'm trying to get a sense of what would be a good scale. So a good Sigma. So the first components, that is the T values. These are measured in days and changing one of these nodes a day to the left or right seems like a small step. So that would make sense. And these are Y axis values. They go from one to 1000. One is maybe too small, but it also seems not totally out of scope. So let's try one and we will need to tune this later. Okay, then we need to decide, do we accept or reject? And for that, we generate our uniform random variable. And we also need to determine the transition probability P. That's done using this function alpha. And what we need is we need pi of y divided by pi of x. And now let me first write that in a way we cannot do it, and then we fix it up. So Pi is prior times likelihood. So I would write here this times likelihood yj divided by the same thing for x. And x is called theta j and theta j. So that's what I would like to write. And I can rearrange this a bit. I want to write that over here. The reason we need to adjust this a bit is that as I explained in the last video, we need to really compute the log likelihood. So we don't actually have this lick. What I kind of mathematically could write would be exponentials of the log likelihood. And what I need to use here is now I just combine these two exponentials. So exponential of a divided by exponential of b is exponential of a minus b. And I can do the same thing here. And that is mathematically the same, but numerically that will work much better because these two numbers are both very negative. So if I subtract them, they are much closer to zero. And you will see that we will actually get a number close enough to zero that that exponential is not zero. What I forgot here now is we need the minimum of that thing and one. And I think that's correct. We could do a similar thing here. We also saw the prior these small numbers. But here it's a bit more difficult because the prior can actually be zero. So this y that is a uniform distribution on the range of all increasing times and so on. And if the proposal is outside this range, for example, if two of the times swap and are no longer in order, then this p will actually be zero. So taking the log is not entirely trivial because a log of zero is not defined. It would probably still work because R allows me to type log of zero and gives minus infinity. And 
if I do exponential of this minus infinity, I get zero back. So probably it would work to work with logs here, but we don't need to worry about that. So I think it will probably work. Let's try that. And then these steps are relatively easy. So if u is less than p, then we accept and say theta j is yj. And otherwise we don't do anything and we need to actually build the time series. I don't know, let's call that theta also. Theta is I've been in trouble with this. I call it capital X just because that's the normal name, but it will still contain theta values. And now I need to be careful because theta is a vector. So I do a matrix. I currently fill with not assigned values and we have N rows and 2K columns. Let's try that. So the J's row of X, we can use in new Theta j. Let's try to run that. So sigma, then the loop, and that didn't quite fit. Let's make the window a bit larger. Here. So these first values are very large because they are times and they are measured in days since the beginning of 1970. But you see, it only ranges from 18347 until 18501. So it's large numbers, but we use only a relatively small range of large numbers that is y values and that should now slowly move towards looking more like the data. So what we can do is we can try to do a plot. So I think if I run that, then I get this scatter plot and then I can steal this s from here and then I do lines s and then I do lambda S and now I do a row of the X to so say X10. So that will be the state of the Markov chain after 10 steps. You see that is still not very close to the data, but let's just for comparison to the first step, I do that in red. Maybe we see that it improved already. It did in a sense improve, namely between May and July, it went up a bit. So what we should be doing now is we should just run that for much longer. So let's not overdo it. Let's just run 1000 steps maybe. So something went wrong. P is not a number. I wonder whether something has, ah, that is infinity. That is not so good, but that should not be a problem. Minimum of that and one still works. So probably something has gone wrong here. Ah, I see what happens. And um, what caused the problem is this quantity here was zero because we proposed a state which is not possible. And this term here numerically came out as infinity. And then R does not know if we do zero times infinity, what that should be, that is not defined. And then the product turned out NAN, which stands for not a number, and that thing can then not be compared to U. So that makes sense. The question is, how do we fix this? So what we really want is, we would want zero here because if we get a invalid state, we should not go there. And that value, which numerically came out as infinity will not be actually infinity. So let me see. That was just not perfectly canceling. So the proposal was minus 80,000 and the old state was minus 100,000. Well, let's do that properly. So here we need to just fudge it up. So we run into numerical problems. We have partially solved them by using the trick with the exp and the log, but not enough. So we have two choices. We could either do a special case and say, if this is zero, then P is zero. That would be maybe the easiest. Alternatively, we could just tell R that that is not actually going to be infinity and just replace it with a very large number if it is infinity. I think what I'll do is I will special case this. So I take this value out first. So let's just call it P Y J. And then I say, if P Y J equals exactly zero, then P is zero. And otherwise P is what we had before. Let's try that, that one at least. And now I want to do my plot again. I just need to find the code again use scatterplot and now we can plot
plot the initial state. I do that again in red. And then maybe after 500 steps, I do it in blue. And after a thousand steps, and you see what happens is the curve now can see the data and is actually getting closer to the data. So 1000 steps was not enough, but the algorithm is clearly doing something. What we could do is we could plot columns of X as a function of time. Let's just do that once. So we can just do X comma one type is L. That is how the first time, so the leftmost cut point moves as a function of steps of the Markov chain. And there are many of them. So let's just add the second one that is guaranteed to be larger. Yeah, now we can see the first curve and now we can add with lines the second one, the third one and the fourth one. So that would be the first four components of theta as a function of time. And you see they move. So our sigma is not totally unreasonable. We do neither get constant rejections nor too small movement. We could even try sigma equals two. We later should be monitoring rejection rates, but for now we can just see what we get. So I redo the plot. So now we see one of the nodes is just stuck at the bottom of the interval, but maybe that is just how it's meant to be because the others are moving. Whatever, for now, I think I switch back to sigma equals one. And later we see what we are doing. But at this stage, we already have the algorithm working. I think there is no problem with it running. And the only things we need to sort out are that we choose sigma correctly, and then we need to look to the results make sense. Okay, so let's look into producing some diagnostic to see whether we have chosen sigma correctly. So first thing I want to do is I want to run the algorithm a bit longer. Let's see how far we can get. And second thing I want to do is I want to just keep a record of the acceptance probability. So that will just be numbers, n of them. And I have them stored here, so I just can say acceptance probability at step j is what I call it. PYJ. And let's just see how long it takes to run 10,000 steps of that. So it didn't take very long at all. And then we can do mean acceptance probability. That seems very small. I wonder whether something has gone wrong. Ah, I plotted the wrong thing. Let's try that again. So what I should have added here was P. My apologies. So that will likely end up better. So now mean of acceptance probability is 0 0.05. That is actually a bit on the small side. If I do sigma equals 0 0.1, then I get one half, which seems like a reasonable value. And let me just see, I do some proper plots now of the paths. So same as before, but with nicer margin. So I'm not sure whether that is good or bad. They move, but they move not very fast. Maybe our sigma is actually too small. I try 0.5. Now they do move noticeably faster, even if the acceptance probability is higher. One moved right to the end, which again, I'm not quite sure whether that is good or bad, but there is at least some movement. And to make the plot even nicer, I do smaller margins. So I would feel more comfortable if the upper line would move away from the top sometimes. Not quite clear why it's stuck there. But let's just plot the AI. So these also move, but maybe even more slowly than the others. We could look into having different sigma for these values. They could maybe do with larger sigma and these maybe with smaller sigma. But who knows? We may need to revisit this. But I think we may be good. Let's just do for completeness what I did earlier. So I plot the lambda together with the data. So here we see what we saw in the other plot. The last node is very close to the end, which has the effect of allowing for a very small downward stick at the end. And at the start, it didn't really capture this increase. I wonder whether we should increase K. I think I'll attempt this. So K was five. Maybe that is just not enough segments. I set it to 10. 
It does not look entirely absurd either, but this spike here seems a bit strange. Let me just go back. That the A values they move, the T values move. Here one could kind of get a sense that it until times 4000 or 5000 moved towards stationarity and afterwards it is maybe close and doesn't change so much anymore. So here we would get a sense maybe 5000 is a plausible burn in period for that. And let's just do mean acceptance probability. 0.14 is not zero, so that would be fine. What I think is, is here this little tick at the end, we don't really want. I think that it's just the last values are low because there was a weekend and it somehow got stuck trying to model this. And I do not entirely understand why that peak is here, but I think it may be a similar effect that that was just weekdays. You see it's low here at one week and, and low at another and in the middle the values are just higher. So I think what we may be running into is that we didn't model that pattern where there are low values on weekends and higher values over the week. And my idea would be instead of making a fancy model we can just change the prior distribution by saying that the segments must have length at least a week. I think I'll try that. So we say Instead, where we said the TI need to be increasing, we say the next one must be at least seven apart from the previous one. Here we need to retry sampling. That was where we sampled random theta. And I think what we should do is we just repeat. So I repeat that. And if diff TI, that's the step sizes, the minimum of these, that's the shortest interval. If it's greater or equal to min step, then I write break, which should end the loop. So my idea is that we retry until we have reached a configuration of times such that the step size is at least seven. And we need to have this also at the boundaries. So we need to do something And now if I call that, it gives me something. And if I do diff that, and only the first k minus minus one of them, all of these numbers are bigger than seven, seems to work. Okay, then we need to be a bit careful here. So that is the, what I just fixed was the sampling of random thetas. Here, that is the density of thetas. We are still uniform on the set, but now it's the set where steps are not only positive, but also bigger than min step. So I think that's the only change needed here. Now, we are still uniform, so the constant will have changed, but we are not tracking the constant. And here, that will bring us to zero if the steps go too close together. And the likelihood has nothing to do with it. Here we don't need to change anything because we rely on the sampling and the prior as we did them before. I think we can just run that and see whether things improved. The picture looks okay. Here we can't see much. Here it did start changing again at the end. And mean acceptance probability oh, is smallish, but I wonder whether we should plot the acceptance probability as a function of time, just in case it changes after burn-in or something. So that is a moving average of the acceptance probability where it takes the average over 100 steps. And you see what's going on at the beginning. The acceptance probabilities are okay, probably while we wiggle towards the data, and then they get much smaller. Okay, so I have now done some more debugging along the same lines, and let me show what I ended up with. The biggest change I've made was I changed the interpretation of theta, namely, here, the last components of theta used to be the AI, the values which are on the y-axis in my plots. And instead, it turned out everything goes much better if I change this to being log AI. And before 
I needed to take here the logarithm of AI, but now that this theta represents the logarithm already, I just write log AI, then I do linear interpolation and exponentiate as before. And that change also needs to be reflected in the prior distribution. So in the prior distribution here, I had earlier checked that that was between zero and e to the u min, which I called a min, and e to the u max, which I had called a max. But now that we are taking the logarithm, I can check this straight against these values. Also, it turned out my old upper bound of 7.2 was maybe a bit small, so I increased this to 8. And going back to the prior distribution, the other change I needed to make was I had originally here this density 1 over product something to compensate for applying the exponential to a uniform distribution. We said the u are uniform and the a are e to the u. But now that theta directly corresponds to the uniform values, so when I sample it's just uniform without the exponential, now this extra density goes away. So that part has simplified. We don't need the basically the derivative, the Jacobian, which comes from the transformation of the UI. So that's a bit simpler. And it did not affect the likelihood. So when I run that, let me just show you then the changes to the nodes are now the same size on this plot, independent of whether we are high up or down here. Whereas before, when they were on the actual scale rather than on the logarithmic scale, then a change of one changed the values a lot here, but until something near the peak change took a long time. So it turns out changing the log by adding a normal distributed random variable with the constant variance worked much better in practice. So I did that. Then I also increased k a bit more, and you see in the picture on the right, that allows it now to kind of nicely match the shape of the data. And I increased the size of n. The another change is I am now using different values for sigma for the t and for the log a. For the t, I use sigma, which is 0.1, so a tenth of a day. But I do very many steps, so the t can actually move because many steps of the size, the tens of the day, will still make noticeable progress on the scale. And for the a, I this value now is much smaller because the log of these values is a smaller quantity, and 0 0.01 seems to work nicely enough. The reason that I think that is now good, let me just go through the plots. First, that is the plot of the acceptance probabilities. It is smooth as before, moving average over 100 values. But you see that had a drop here, but it still looks then quite reasonable. It seems to be constant above 0.2. So I think the step sizes are now okay if we have this. And that is the t values. So you see here on the y axis, my scale is again days since beginning of 1970. But you see here, the values actually move to the end. For example, that moves. I've added two lines here. I added, added one line for today and one line for the time of the first data set, because these are always implicit and fixed in the way we interpret theta. So we have this, and I would think that looks good. They cannot move too much because they are required to stay at least a week apart. So I guess this band here is just them being a week apart, for example. So there is only so much room for them to wiggle, but some of them do. And this is what used to be the AI. So I should write now log AI. And again, you see these first during what I would think of as a burn-in phase move quite nicely. And then also they still, when I hope we have reached stationarity or are close to stationarity, are still moving. So we are good on that front. And the last plot, plot you have already seen, this function of lambda, that is for the final state, that is maybe not perfect, but I think that looks reasonable. So that is what I will now use for my analysis. And I just saw I should have written i here and i here because there is really 100,000 steps. So that is the correct y-axis. Good. And with this, I will finish my discussion on how I tune the algorithm. And in the next video, we will see what we can learn by running this algorithm. So we are now going to discuss Markov chain Monte Carlo estimates using
this implementation of the random walk metropolis algorithm and my aim is the to find out about the growth rates and about the uncertainty in the estimates I get about the growth rates. Good, so see you in the next video.